but this is what I've been saying until the American people you know, settle down. But I do want to talk to you about balanced budget amendment because that is something we all agreed to. It, it was included. We will take a vote on that in the House and the Senate, but we, that had Republican votes and Democrats alike, and the President signed it. Uh, I don't think it's radical uh, to ask the federal government to do what you all do. Uh, every uh, year at home, and that's to uh, not spend money that you don't have. Uh, states do it, uh, local communities do it, and so I think the idea that we ask the federal government, I think that's why we got bipartisan support to have that vote, is because you know we don't think uh, that we can continue uh, to be on this trajectory. I mean, the fact is, uh, we are burying our kids and grandkids with yet. And I don't know how any of us look our kids in the eye and explain to them why we're not willing to pay for the things that we're enjoying today, why we're going to send them the bill. I just think that's wrong. We have, we have time. Okay, one, more, one more question. Actually, oh. we've, got, we've got three. Okay. I'm Pam Hoffman. I'm a uh, Democrat from constituent district. You say that we as uh, individuals, as families, that we don't go into debt. I'm wondering how many of us have mortgages, credit cards, car loans. We're in debt, all of us, I would, or most of us. I would imagine we're trying to keep it under control, but we are in debt. Why should the federal government be any different from the rest of us? Besides that, when we have an emergency, Stuff goes on the Discover card, the Visa card. What will the federal government have if we have a balanced budget amendment? What happens in Katrina or in Joplin? I, and I don't disagree with you. We have mortgages. And if you, I probably have one of those too. The slide that shows the nation has always had debt. Uh, this one. See how we've always had debt? That's because we understand that. Uh, roads and bridges, I mean, short of national defense. Uh, infrastructure is probably the, maybe the second most important function of the federal government. Those are long-term investments in capital. So you would expect, I think, to, to have debt on a long-term capital uh, project just like you would on your mortgage. The problem we have gotten into, though, is we can't pay defense, Medicare, Social Security. We can't even pay the interest on our debt, let alone the bills for all all of the dis non-defense discretionary budgets. Uh, we can't, that, that's like paying your light bill and your grocery bill. When you start borrowing money to do that, you're in trouble. And so what we're suggesting is uh, how about we pay uh, the day-to-day -day bills and not go into debt there. And again, it goes back to that one slide of matching our revenues with our expenditures. I think there will always be debt that's acceptable to the American people for long-term uh, projects like roads and bridges. Uh, but uh, you know, we, we still have to get, get it in line. And the other thing on uh, like national security issues and things, what states do is they carry over a cash uh, reserve requirement just much like the families I mean, that I would uh, work with as a CPA, I would ask that they try to reserve back money in case of emergency. Uh, I hope all of you have been advised of something similar. I mean, you need to save back in case something unexpected happens, you save money back. You know, that's what states do. Uh, it, it's not uh, unrealistic to ask the federal government to do the same. Yeah. Um. Mike Steven, I live on 258th Street. Um, I'm a locomotive engineer and I work for BNSF. And we've done a lot of discussing among union people and I think some of us are very concerned with uh, what Obama has done <coughs> to our manufacturing base as far as, like, we can't build coal plants out in western Kansas. Those are good jobs. Those are railroad jobs. Those are coal manufacturing jobs. Uh, we're using the federal regulatory power. A lot of us feel it's an abuse of that to take away jobs, and yet you say, on one hand, you say, we want to bring manufacturing back to this country. That's what Obama said. But then he turns around and puts 
just a host of regulations, and that affects the economic ability of corporations and companies to be able to relocate in this country. And I, the problem is we've got to get the private sector rebuilt, <coughs> and we can't do it with what's going on from the federal government. And just like this, this uh, cutting the taxes for the corporations, well, we don't cut them. The money's going to go overseas. The money's going to go elsewhere. We want to make a, a situation where the money comes to this country, we rebuild the manufacturing base, and we can get some good jobs back here. Amen. I mean, the American people, um, the American people can compete with anyone in this world. I have all the confidence in the world. We just need to get the barriers to job creation out of the way. The, the regulation, as you suggest, is killing jobs people, uh, especially in the area of the environment. They can go in other countries that aren't doing anything about it, uh, taxation. Oh, I'm hopeful <laughs> that we yeah. can address uh, some of that, uh, Terry. Um, I brought some information for you to review on... Uh, louder, louder, stand up, please. Uh, have that to I brought some information, and I was asking for you to review the problem that we're having with drug shortages, and the gray markets are buying up and intentionally stockpiling to where they're price gouging sometimes 4,000% or more, and most insidious are oncology drugs because a lot of the pediatric um, situations can be curable, but they can't get the drugs. So I'm just asking if you would review this and support legislation that would hold the drug um, distribution accountable for what Sure, we'd be happy to look at it and uh, get some uh, expert advice maybe from our, our pharmacist. Okay, yeah. Jim? Uh, Congresswoman, you know, I think that there's a, a real disconnect between our long-term objectives. I think anybody in this room can look at uh, the, the proposals of reform that you look at in a long-term perspective and say, yes, most of that makes sense. We have to do things differently. But you also made the point very clearly that we're in a very serious crunch where we don't have we don't have revenues. Why do you think there's such intrans intransigence uh, that exists uh, in Congress where you cannot find a short-term solution that is acceptable to most of the, the uh, congressional leaders and, and, their, and their base that can allow us to you know, raise revenues in the short term in order to get through this crisis? As business owners, you know, we're looking at solutions every day and modifying how we do things. It seems like you know, you're, you're looking at you know, water conservation when the house is on fire. Yeah, we've got to look at both. And, and we, we come up with solutions every day to modify our, the way we do things in a new world. Why do you think that that's not, uh, that's not uh, happening? That, for example, um, the thing that created, one of the triggers that created the crisis in 2008 was, uh, was credit default swaps in, in the derivatives market. And why has Congress done nothing to regulate the derivatives market when the major banks of the United States hold $182 billion in credit default swaps against Greece? What happens, what happens when Greece defaults and on the short term we go into another tailspin because those banks, now tied to their commercial accounts, have to cover that? Who's going to bail them out this time? Yeah, yeah you make a good point, one that we probably should know, and we're not the only ones in uh, fiscal uh, decline. Yes. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, it is uh, happening all across the world, which is, is, is being reflected uh, in our markets as well. You know, and I think the reason uh, no one on either side of the aisle wants to do anything short term is the mantra we hear uh, from the American people, certainly from uh, small business, uh, large business alike, is that more than anything else, it's the uncertainty about what's going on in the federal uh, government that is holding them back. People are sitting on cash, even businesses that have cash are sitting on it. Families that might have cash, they're sitting on it. And what we need to do is give people the confidence in our economy to cut loose with that, uh, to consume and to uh, buy property, plant and equipment, to invest in jobs. And they're simply not going to do that because right now they're scared, they're paralyzed with fear uh, that their income tax is going to go up 
and that means they, they have to either lay somebody else off to pay for the increased tax, or uh, they can't hire uh, the next employee. Uh, same with the regulation. You know, we're hearing these crazy stories uh, from regulators, uh, stories of all about extortion, where people are being asked to write a check to cover their penalty before uh, the regulator leaves, because if they leave, it's going to double. I mean, the, the regulators are off the chain, and the same with the litigators. People are scared to death that somebody's going to sue them. I read an article in, I think it was Cap Journal yesterday, about uh, the unsubstantiated uh, lawsuit. So, I, I think until we can give them the certainty, I mean, nobody wants another band-aid for anything. This isn't rocket science, uh, it's just numbers. We know how to solve the problem, we just need to go do it. I wasn't suggesting that you do something in the short term that would contradict your long-term okay. laws. Okay. What I was saying is that you could offer a, a bill that would uh, perhaps uh, give uh, companies a 20% uh, uh, reduction you know, for hiring a new person. You could start offering pieces of that uh, tax reform that would bring companies that have moved overseas and giving them a, a moratorium for two years, which would bring back enormous amounts of tax revenue which you have zero of now. There are a lot of things that could be done. But I think what people are frustrated with is you see this intransigence locked into putting stakes in the ground you know, and not moving and not being able to compromise. That's the uncertainty. Yeah. And that uncertainty is, I think, more of a point than the other three that you made in terms of what affects our economy. Right. Uh, and the fact is, we have bills in the House that do both of those things, a, a repatriation holiday and an investment. But again, uh, you send those to the Senate, and they just see the world differently. Uh, so it really goes back to the intransigency and just the, uh, I, you know, we've probably talked this to death this morning just about uh, we have to all uh, give a little bit. And I, I am there with those members, and I see, I think they're reflective of their constituency. And so we, I think we kind of all need to make an effort uh, to change uh, that. Okay, could I just stay? Do I have time? Could I stay? If somebody has a question. Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, how about if we didn't get to your question, will you come? I'm sorry, I should have introduced Bill Rowe with our Topeka office, and uh, Pat Leopold is my chief of staff. He lives here in Lawrence, works in Topeka, but he does commute uh, to DC. Uh, at least once a month to make sure uh, our staff there is on the tracks. If you could grab one of the three of us uh, before you leave, give us your name so we can address your question. And obviously, uh, you don't have to wait for me to come to town uh, to do a town hall. If you have an issue that needs to be addressed, some help you need with something, uh, some information that we can share back and forth, uh, please uh, give us a, a call, an email, uh, shoot us a letter. Uh, we need to hear from you. That's the only way I can do my job well. So I appreciate you coming out. Uh,